I'm Margie Weiss, co-president of the League of Women Voters of Highland Park Highwood. It's my pleasure to welcome you on, be on behalf of ourselves and our co-sponsoring Leagues of Women Voters of Deerfield and Lake Forest Lake Bluff. We want to welcome all of you to our forum on the role of the federal government in public education. It's my pleasure to introduce Faye Grossman now, who is Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Highland Park Highwood, who will brief us on the history of the federal government's role in education. I spent all day trying to get this to five minutes, and I find it's all on the back of the program. But <laughs> the f even before there was a federal government, there was a, there was a government under the Articles of Confederation. In 1787, when they welcomed in new territories taken from the British, uh, they also divided up the, the uh, land into 36 square miles. Uh, one, mi one of the sections was set aside for education way back in 1787. And while the federal constitution gave the right for schools to be in the hands of the states, they had something in the back of their mind like Article I, Section 8, which gave them the right to take care of the general welfare, and they could tax for things they thought were good for the general welfare, and that's how they got us in the future. The first six presidents all wanted to make sure that we had an educated electorate because they stood for election every two years. But there was no money for this, and we were expanding at a great pace. So the first real um, help that the federal government gave was in land. As we acquired more and more land, taking it from the Indians, the Spanish, wherever, uh, we, gave <laughs> we set aside uh, 77 m million acres for public education. Um, nothing else was done until after the Civil War, and during the Civil War. The 1862 Morrill Act uh, established land-grant colleges, and many of you went to the University of Illinois, as I did, and uh, that is a land-grant school, uh, as well as most of the Big Ten. And all they had to do was establish an agricultural school, which they still have, and the ROTC to help train officers in the future armies. Uh, then, after the Civil War, we had 13, we had three new amendments to the Constitution, 13, 14, and 15, which gave the former slaves uh, citizenship, uh, freedom, citizenship, and um, the right to go to school like anybody else. So this already began to force schools to expand their uh, programs. Uh, in 1867, the first Department of Education was founded. And in 1890, when the frontier closed, as we know, that was the end of the free land, um, they decided that vocational education and industrial arts and things of that sort were good for the um, country because we are now going into the Industrial Revolution. In 1917, vocational education was added to the programs. And in 1941, when school districts were impacted by the children of service people, the federal government began to give money so that um, these uh, communities would not have to take the full burden. And uh, Highland Park, Highwood, uh, I think in Lake Forest too, is still um, impacted that way. Um, then after the First World War, we decided to um, fund raising for more um, home ec students and industrial arts for children uh, in the high schools. And, and then there was a, a, a lull until um, after World War II when eight million American service personnel used the GI Bill to be uh, educated in universities, colleges, trade schools, whatever they uh, needed to do, which gave us a huge 
um, base of um, educated young people. Then another quiet time until um, 1958 when Sputnik went up and the United States got a little scared and so we decided to fund uh, money for teachers for science, math, and foreign languages. Um, then um, in um, 1965, we got Title I, which in, gave money for uh, schools and for reading, uh, even into the Catholic schools. Uh, as long as they didn't have them in the same building, they could teach reading and get federal funds. Um, then there was a Rehabilitation Act, which um, uh, um, said that children um, who were men physically or mentally uh, developmental or had in disabilities had to be educated, which is another um, fee for the schools to um, pay for. Um, then small things like the ETS was given the uh, right to make national surveys and President Clinton came up with a program uh, he wanted to close schools that weren't performing uh, he wanted the end of social promotions he wanted to um, uh, make sure parents knew what their schools were doing but his program did not fly but most of it was incorporated in No Child Left Behind with George W. Bush. And that's the law that is now under consideration for change. And um, uh, President Obama was going to reauthorize it, but um, this has been um, stalled in Congress like everything else right now. And. Um, so here we are, and the future is here. Uh, our speakers uh, are going to tell us what's coming up for education and the federal government and your tax dollar. Uh, I want to introduce Rosemary uh, Heilman, who's going to introduce the speakers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming tonight. Uh, we're very happy to see representatives from the Lake County Leagues Deerfield area, Highland Park, soon to be Highwood, Lake Forest, Lake Bluff. I'm Rosemary Heileman. I do sit on the board of the Lake County League as a liaison from the Deerfield League. So we're happy to have our speakers here as well. Thank you for giving up your evening. This is part of a nationwide League of Women Voters of the United States study on the federal role, uh, the, the role of the federal government in public education. And despite all the things that Faye mentioned that the go federal government has gotten involved with, there is still an expectation that each state has responsibilities for education as well. So the degree of involvement in the federal government has been an ongoing and interesting uh, conversation in this country. We have three distinguished speakers tonight. Uh, the first one is Ralph Martiri who will be speaking on funding and equity in education. He is the executive director of the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability and has been there since 2000. Uh, and this is a not nonprofit bipartisan think tank uh, uh, um, based in Chicago. Then secondly, we have Dr. Sue Hebson, whom many of you probably know. She is the Assistant Superintendent of Schools for High School District 113, specializing in curriculum and instruction. And her topic is the latest, hottest topic, the Common Core Curriculum, Standards and Assessments. And our third speaker is well known to many of us. Kathy Rigg has been the president of Voices for Illinois Children for two years, but she was also a legislator in the state of Illinois for many of us, and we're happy to have her here tonight. Thank you. She will be speaking on early childhood education, which is also an important focus of uh, federal interest. Each speaker will have about 20 minutes or so, and then at the end, we will take questions. So thank you, and I give you um, Ralph Martiri. 
if you think about my job and job description, I work at a tax policy think tank. I'm frankly pretty happy to get invited anywhere. <laughs> now, we are going to talk about public education in America. But one of the big misconceptions out there today is that the system is broken. It is not, in fact, broken. In many instances, the American education system is, in fact, the envy of the entire world. Everyone talks about testing and assessments. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Program for International Assessment, PISA. It is the international test utilized. It, it evaluates critical thinking and it, reading math science scores. And overall, US schools scored average, about 500 on this test, when 493 was the total average. But that doesn't tell the story. American schools with 0 to 10 percent poverty scored 551. That was the best in the world. You hear all these comparisons of America to Finland and how we're falling behind fin We beat Finland. We beat China. We beat them all in our low poverty schools. In fact, the next cut on poverty, we did pretty good too. 10 to 25 percent poverty scored 527. It's about fourth highest in the entire world and higher than any other nation with a similar poverty makeup. Second place was Canada. So it's not the education system as a whole that's in crisis. It's the education system for children in poverty that's in crisis. That's where American schools fell off the map and scored abysmally. So in those communities, that have adequate resources to invest in providing a quality education, guess what? It is an incredibly high quality education. The problem is the majority of communities in America no longer have those resources and can no longer provide a quality education. So now, you are, as a league, looking into what the role of the federal government ought be in education. I'm going to tell you what I think right now. I'm going to give you the conclusion right now. If the federal government does not step in and assume a huge new role in public education, it is, in fact, game over for those communities in poverty, and increasingly middle income communities. Now, I've I'm, I'm got two things I don't normally read off the PowerPoint that's really tacky, but I'm going to. This was specifically found. I want you to think about who made these findings. There are grave disparities and inadequacies in educational quality, both from state to state and within the states. That's finding number one. Finding number two, because of the tie, between economic competitiveness and educational attainment, these disparities have risen from matters of local concern to national concern. Who do you think made that finding? Do you know? The Nixon Commission in 1972. In 1972. They did a little more work, that Nixon Commission on Education. The reason I'm so fired up about the Nixon Commission, and one of the things that you may not know, I'm actually serving on a current federal commission on educational excellence and equity. And it's amazing to me that we are looking at the exact same issues the Nixon Commission looked at 40 years ago. They also found that money can help solve many of the educational problems we have. In fact, they, they even had a line in the commission report that said, any argument that money doesn't matter in providing a quality education is laughable. Of course it matters. You know, I, I, just to digress on that point, I have heard the argument that money just doesn't matter in education way too many times. I don't get why people take it seriously. What is the money used for? It's to buy teachers, academic program, technology. Those things cost. You want an extended school day? That costs. You want quality pre-K? That costs. 
It's not like they're taking money and giving it to the school system and the school system buries it under a rock. It costs to buy the inputs that constitute a quality education. So, money matters. Nixon Commission also found that educational funding at the state level is too tied to property taxes and is rarely connected to the educational needs of kids. Really? Boy, we fixed that one, huh? Better yet. They found states have the responsibility to reform the system. And they said, states, go out there and eliminate these discrepancies. Go out there and pass reforms so that you can fund a quality education for every kid. The Nixon Commission directed the states to do that in 1972. How's that been working for us? Yeah. They had one other interesting finding in the Nixon Commission. When the scope of the problem or the achievement of the solution is beyond the political or financial capacity of the states, the feds should step in. I think the states have demonstrated they have neither the political will nor the fiscal capacity to fund a quality education for every child. We've known what, nation at risk, Nixon Commission, do we need another report? The bottom line is, this is a national concern. There's a complete tie between your ability to be competitive in a global economy and your educational attainment. And if we systemically deny a portion of our population, increasingly low-income, middle-income kids, the opportunity to learn the skills they need, they won't be viable economic units in this new economy and they'll fall behind and they have. So I want to drive the home point on how bad the states are by focusing on a really big and rich state and what it has done. And guess what state that is? Illinois. Yeah. Or you, I think we should change the state name to Alabama after I'm done with this. What is education competing with in our general fund budget? This is historically what our state government has spent its money on over the last 35, 40 years. Look at that. Education, health care, human services, public safety. That is nine out of ten dollars. So the, this is where education has to fight. It's fighting for dollars against health care, human services, and public safety. Right now, it's the top priority in the general fund in the state of Illinois. So it is our state's number one priority. But here's the problem with our state's funding for it. We don't have enough money to invest, and so we keep pushing the responsibility to local property taxes. Here's why. Entering January of this year, the state had to put together a budget for fiscal year 2012. They were looking at that. It starts on June 1st. Revenue from all sources they were expecting at $26 billion. It's a lot of revenue. Hard costs, though, they had to pay out of the revenue. Before they could fund one penny on public services was $18 billion. This is debt service, pension obligations, oh, and over $6 billion in past due bills left over from the prior fiscal year. Yeah, folks delivered the services, the state just didn't pay them. And then they were looking at, gee, what was the budget in 2011 for public services? That nine out of ten dollars going to educate? Well, it was 24 billion. You add 24 to 18, you come up with 42 billion. That, that, only 26 billion in revenue. That's a 15.9 billion dollar deficit, all of which falls in the general fund for services because you've got to pay your hard costs. You can't default on the bank loans. You've got to make your pension payment. You've got to pay your past due bills. So that's a 60% deficit in funding education, health care, human services, and public safety. That's where they were January of this year when they passed that tax increase, moving the personal income tax rate in Illinois up from 3 to 5%. So how did Illinois get there? Well, if you read, there's this semi-literate rag, what's it called, the Chicago Tribune. If you read the Chicago Tribune, 
you would think wasteful, profligate spending is the reason Illinois has a giant budget deficit on its hand. And absolutely not. That's not true. I looked at general fund spending over the last decade. Nominal dollars, sure, we spent about 25% more in the year 2010 than we had a decade earlier, but that doesn't adjust for inflation or population growth. It costs more to provide the same level of services year to year. So I did a radical thing. I adjusted state spending for inflation. I used the Consumer Price Index, the CPI. And lo and behold, in 2010, in real terms, we were spending at least 5% less than we'd spent a decade earlier on those four core services. 5% less. Now, I just understated the cut to those public services, and here's why. That is predicated on the Consumer Price Index, which is a really good inflation metric for the economy as a whole, right? But because it's a good inflation metric for the economy as a whole, it's not so good for evaluating public spending. Think about it. It includes things like Clorox, Pop-Tarts, hair care products. State government doesn't buy a lot of Clorox or Pop-Tarts or, well, at least since Blagojevich has been gone, hair care products. <laughs> what, what state government buys is labor. Those are labor-intensive services, education, health, 80, 85 percent of every budget is the labor cost. There is an inflation metric tied to labor. It's the employment cost index. Adjusting our spending for inflation using the more accurate employment cost index, we were actually spending about 20 percent less in 2010 than we had a decade earlier on those four core services. That's the reality. So I just thought I'd give you a list. Here's the cut across the board in real terms. You could see that the general fund itself was cut 22%. K-12 was cut 9.3%. Higher ed, 36%. Human services, 31%. So that I'd highlight what has been cut in Illinois over the last decade. Now, the reason we got here wasn't profligate spending. The reason we got to this point was we have tax policy that just doesn't work. It's not designed to work in a modern capitalist economy. There are four principles of sound taxation. It needs to be fair, responsive, stable, and efficient. Illinois is 0 for 4. So if you're 0 for 4 on tax policy, you get this. This is called the structural deficit. Has anyone heard that? I'm going to have a quiz on this later, so you better be paying attention. Anybody heard structural deficit? Heard that? It's a real simple concept. All we did was take the state spending level right now in 2012 and adjust it for inflation and population growth going forward. Existing law continued. The same level of services tomorrow that we provide today. Then we took our mix of revenue sources after the tax increase and adjusted that for inflation and population growth going forward, assuming a normal economy. That's the red line. The gap between revenue growth and the cost of maintaining services from year to year is the structural deficit. We have that in Illinois because we don't tax the right way. And so when you have really bad tax policy that constrains public resources to the point where every year you just don't have quite enough money to continue providing the prior year's level of services, what do you do? Well, if you're responsible, you either cut spending to the core to balance your budget, or you raise the tax revenue to maintain your expenditures. This is Illinois. So being responsible had nothing to do with what they decided to do. They underfunded the pensions. So for decades, decades, instead of actually making their contribution to the pension system, they said, oh, we're just going to skip that or skip most of that and use it to fund those four core services for decades. So by 1994, they had built up an unfunded liability in the five pension systems of $20 billion. Billion with a B. It's a big number. They said, all right, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to pass a law, the pension ramp, that's the ramp right there, that's going to require us to pay off this unfunded liability by the year 2045. We'll be 90% funded in all our pension systems. And these are the annual increases in, in the future years every year to year to make up for that difference. They passed a new enhanced payment requirement and didn't pass a nickel of revenue to pay for it. Really? Who thought that would work? 
they had a structural deficit. You know who didn't think it would work? The legislators who passed that bill. Because in the first 15 years of the pension ramp, by law, they didn't make their full pension contribution into the system. They codified their irresponsible fiscal practice. So by law, they grew that unfunded liability from 20 to $45 billion in 2008. And then the market crashed. And we lost half the value of the assets we had invested in, and it went to $85 billion overnight. That's the fiscal system in which education funding in Illinois has to compete for dollars. It doesn't work, and it's bankrupt going forward. Is that unclear? So, <laughs> the new tax increase. We went from three to five points on the income tax, raising six billion. We increased the corporate rate from 4.8 to 7 to raise another 770 million, and then we took away a couple of corporate tax breaks, one temporarily, one permanently. Total of 7.2 billion dollars. That's what we're getting in new annual revenue. Now, what's the problem with that? What was the hole? Almost 16. So after we passed this, and my organization said this at the time when folks were coming back saying we've solved the problem. <laughs> We say, no, you've left an $8.5 billion deficit in your general fund. That's where we are today. Now, I do have to deal with some of this corporate silliness. So we increased our corporate tax rates, and then a number of wahoos, and by wahoos I mean the governors of Wisconsin, Indiana, and New Jersey, came to Illinois and said, now that you've increased your corporate income tax rate, your businesses are going to run to our states. Really? Our new rate is 7% for businesses. Then it drops down by 2015 to 5.2. The current rate in Indiana is 8.5%, more than our new rate. Has been for decades. Current rate in Wisconsin, more than our new rate. Current rate in New Jersey, a lot more than our new rate. And who questioned them on this? Absolutely nobody. So the media let them get away with this silliness. Illinois is just trying to pay its bills. The truth about this state's tax policy. Before that tax increase, we were one of the lowest taxing states in the nation. Numbers. We have the fifth highest population, fifth highest GDP. We ranked 44th in total state and local tax burden as a percentage of income. 44th. We ranked 43rd in spending. So we're a big population state, we're a big economic state, we're a very low tax and low spending state. We can't even afford our current level of low spending. We have a structural deficit that guarantees future cuts. So I just gave you some of this data, so I'm gonna jump. Oh, by, by the way, our economic growth, despite being low tax, has lagged both the US and the Midwest by a little bit for a long period of time. This is from 1990 to 07, pre-recession. You don't want the Great Recession to muck things up. But it's misleading here, the comparison with the Midwest, because the Midwest includes a state called Michigan, and Michigan hasn't had a good economy since Moses. So if you take Michigan out of the Midwest, Midwestern economic growth jumps up to 60%. So we lagged everybody in the Midwest except Michigan. We were about tied with Ohio. So this low tax, low spending state hasn't found any economic competitiveness from being low tax and low spending. And what we did was we lost our high paying good benefit jobs and we replaced them with low paying, low to no benefit service sector jobs. While we're low tax overall, we are high tax in one way, property taxes. We're the sixth most reliant state in the nation on property taxes. Why? Education. Despite education being the number one priority in Springfield, it gets more money than anything else, we rank 49th out of the 50 states in the portion of education funding covered by state resources. Do you know who's 50th? Any ideas? Nope. No, everybody says those states. Nevada. Nevada. But Nevada doesn't make up for the difference with property taxes. They use gaming revenue. 
And I know we have more than one proposal that we should go to a slots for tots method of school funding. <laughs> I don't think that's the way we ought to be going. Now this over-reliance on local property taxes to fund education creates great disparities. It, it literally ties the quality of the public education a kid gets to the affluence of the community in which the kid lives. It's also hard for people. So from 1990 to 07, after you take out inflation, property taxes in Illinois jumped 53% in real terms. Median income was only up 4.9. You got your property taxes growing at over 10 times the rate of growth in income for most families in our state. <coughs> From 2000 to 07, property taxes up 23 points, median income down by five points. So it's a very difficult way to tax families too, in addition to creating great disparities in education. I thought I'd give you how much the cut in public education funding looks like uh, from 2000 through 2012. Feel good about that big red bar. That's what we're doing. This is the scary bar. Who here has heard of the Education Funding Advisory Board, EFAB? Anybody heard of EFAB? EFAB is a nonpartisan group in Springfield that makes a recommendation for what the minimum expenditure per kid should be for K through 12. It's called the foundation level. And the foundation level includes your, your basic cost of education and keeping the building clean and your basic administrative salaries. It doesn't include things like special ed, transportation, all these things that there are mandated categoricals for. It's <clears throat> purely the education and keeping the building running fund. When they made their first recommendation of what the foundation level should be to provide an adequate education to kids, and they defined adequate by getting about two-thirds of the children passing the state standardized test. Here's what this would cost per kid. We were $100 less at our foundation level in Illinois than the EFAB recommendation. Today, we're almost $2,000 less per kid in funding a basic quality education. And so you wonder why the system isn't generating the results you want. It doesn't have the capacity. I, I try to think about things like, I was a business lawyer for years, so if it cost your business $1,000 to manufacture a car, and 10 years ago you were giving your workers $100 worth of investments, they couldn't build much of a car, could they? They'd build the thing I'm driving. If you increased your funding seven times in a decade and you were giving them 700 bucks, they still couldn't build the car. You gotta know what it costs. And you gotta give the district the capacity to purchase those inputs that drive student achievement. We don't do that as a state in Illinois. We leave it up to school districts to make up the difference. And so those affluent communities that can do, I serve on the school board in River Forest, great schools. You go about a mile away from my house to Austin, tell me you want to send your children to those schools. So defunding education, and you're going to have to yell at me when I'm near my time. Okay, so give me two more minutes and we'll close, because I want to get into race for a second here. Defunding education makes no sense. The Nixon Commission found that education, no attainment, and the economy were linked, and it's more linked now than ever. So for the longest time, there was a direct correlation between educational attainment and unemployment rates, right? Where the higher level of educational attainment, the lower your unemployment rate, except for art history majors, and no one can help them. <laughs> the, the difference has come on wages. Now there is a direct correlation between educational attainment and wage, so much so that the only cohort of workers in Illinois since 1980 who have seen their incomes increase at a rate greater than inflation, so a real increase in purchasing power, actually have a college degree. Every other worker has seen their income decline after inflation over the last 30 years. So you gotta learn to earn, but we in Illinois are disinvesting. We also know our wage gap between whites and minorities is getting worse. So the wage gap between whites and Latinos has grown. This is from 1980 to 07, taking out the Great Recession by 40%, 39.7. Some neutral labor market forces at play and some discrimination. The neutral labor market forces, you've got English as a second language issues, you've got an immigrant population willing to take low paying jobs. You actually have the youngest and least educated cohort Latinos in our entire workforce, also indicia of taking lower paying jobs. 
How about that wage growth between whites and blacks in Illinois of 126% since 1980? As far as neutral labor market forces, I got nothing. Certainly race very much plays a role in labor markets and the wrong way in Illinois. But in addition to discrimination, the way we fund schools has contributed. More than 50 years after Brown versus Board, we're the third most segregated state in the nation. And so we're not just still separate, this being Illinois, we're still unequal. With minority districts on average starting off with over $1,100 per kid per school year K through 12 to spend on education. And our starting point is almost $2,000 below the cost of inadequate education. So effectively, our fiscal system is structurally racist. It has singled out African American kids for an underfunded education. And education matters to be competitive in a global economy, so these kids aren't developing the skills they need to become competitive, so they don't. And guess what? That will show up in your wage data, and it has. So, I only want to show one more thing on this, and then I will sit down. I, I'm not even, I had a regression analysis to talk about. <laughs> that you all wanted to, I, anyway. But here's the kicker to me. 55% of the black kids in Illinois attend the 5% of school districts with the greatest poverty, over half. These school districts have less to spend on education than any other districts in Illinois. Over nine out of 10 African Americans, 92%, attend school districts where poverty levels are 30% or greater. Poverty becomes a real obstacle to educating children at 25 points, huge obstacle, okay? We have a state system that doesn't work. We don't have the political will to fix it. Worse than that, we're not alone. Almost every one of the 50 states has a huge problem providing an adequate education to all of its children. Maybe not as bad as Illinois, but bad. And we're not gonna solve that problem if we leave it up to the states. Nixon tried that in 72. 40 years is a long enough test period. It is time for a bigger, stronger federal role. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Martiri. A uh, lot to think about in the funding issue. Now, as Monty Python used to say, for something completely different, <laughs> there's the question of, well, if uh, the money's coming from the federal government or if they're going to be national standards financially, then what are the schools going to be teaching? Does the person with the buck get the right to tell you what you're going to teach and do they get the right to assess it? So uh, Dr. Sue Hepson is going to talk about the Common Core Standards and Assessment and what is being proposed uh, for the future. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, Ralph's presentation is, is very connected to this one insofar as some of the rationale or some of the realization about those types of issues and problems as it pertains to student achievement is exactly the reason that there has been a common core uh, movement and an initiative. Um, Faye talked a little bit about some of the state history. There is a great deal of history related to just standards in general. Um, in our field of education, there are a lot of different organizations who have been highly invested in um, creating standards, documenting achievement. Uh, for instance, A Nation at Risk is a uh, dated now uh, presentation that spoke to um, reading and math again, and you'll see um, the Common Core is based at this present time on uh, English language arts, literacy, so reading and writing, et cetera, and math specifically. So they started in the same place in a way that the Nation at Risk report um, communicated to us back in 85, watch out, we have some work to do. There are some students who are not making progress and um, we need to understand where their gaps are and we need to act on those gaps. In a lot of ways, the presentation that Ralph just gave to you um, really creates the same picture. 
Um, maybe not looking at it from the achievement data side, looking at it more on the finance side, but it's the same kinds of kids and it's the same kinds of reports uh, that basically are waving a white flag and saying, hello, anyone out there, let's really pay attention. So all of the other efforts that you see are other kinds of initiatives and reactions and responses to that reality of an achievement gap and a desire to ensure that all students can succeed. When we, when we moved into the, the No Child Left Behind era, the philosophy behind that type of an approach and a response to, again, this achievement gap makes all the sense in the world. You want to ensure that all students are successful, and one of the key ways to ensure that all students are successful are to not give a broad sweep of 80% of our kids did well on this state test, 84%, 88%, whatever that big broad sweep is, but rather pay attention to subpopulations. Um, some of the schools that have continued in, in Illinois to achieve AYP actually don't have subpopulations. And so that's one of the key reasons that they continue to achieve AYP, despite the fact that the, the level of, um, of academic achievement continues to go up on, a, on an annual basis. But as an educator, we're very open to, um, to wanting to ensure that all students can succeed and to uh, the data analysis that we've learned is a really important part of that achievement. So, in other words, bring on the subpopulation data. We're looking at our own subpopulation data. Um, and so philosophically, some of the um, legislation related to No Child Left Behind, I think was really important to the entire nation because it was that wake up call for a lot of different systems um, to not just say we have great schools because in general, students were doing well, students might have been going to college, et cetera, but very specifically, who is doing well and who is not doing well and what are you educators going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? When you look at the Common Core Standards, one of the key things that uh, became a part of the thinking there was really what the title suggests, common. Um, an intention to ensure that the entire nation could in fact say that they can provide a quality education for all students and not leave that definition of a quality education up to a classroom teacher or to a local board or to a local community or to a state. Um, they wanted to be able to say that across the nation we have um, the desire certainly to be globally competitive. We have the economic need to be globally competitive. And so we can't anymore allow such a control at the local level that basically teachers kind of go into their own classroom, close their own door, and decide what they want to teach even though the school board has approved XYZ textbook. In some ways you can think that although we certainly have been locally controlled and are heavily um, locally controlled, and in our case very thrilled about that actually, um, we know that there's a great deal of buy-in that will have to be a part of this Common Core Standards movement to ensure that teachers really are held, continue to be held accountable to what this curriculum then is. And the curriculum is written in such a way that, that, they, that it's very conceptual, especially in the math area, and um, highly, highly uh, rigorous really in both areas, both in the English side of it, the writing, reading, the language side, um, and in the mathematics. One of the key reasons that we changed the um, standards was that the expectations were so different across the entire nation. The, um, not just when students transferred or high levels of mobility or whatever, but really when you look at college readiness, college and career readiness across the nation, there are so many pockets in America where students really aren't prepared. And there's been study after study that points out that more and more kids have to have remedial experiences in college before they can really begin the collegiate program. Um, so that type of data was yet another precursor for wanting to move forward with these types of standards. The, some other key goals were um, 
making sure that there were consistent academic benchmarks, making sure that the states then would have the opportunity to collaborate on a broader level. Um, again, No Child Left Behind is a perfect example. Although that's a federal mandate, every single state was able to come up with their own particular assessment system. And so um, when Illinois has nearly 80 plus percent of its schools now labeled as failing schools, that's just Illinois system. And it does not compute and it does not compare to lots of other states. And so from an accountability standpoint, looking at the core standards and realizing then that once you come up with the standards, you need to then come up with assessments that align with those standards to make sure in education the left and the right hand are working together, then you're going to be moving forward with more of an apples to apples assessment comparison and um, uh, the, the achievement outcomes really would be an apples to apples comparison also, also across the nation. So there's a great deal of opportunity for strong collaboration. There's a great deal of opportunity for um, a, a better sense of competitiveness in the global market because the standards that were actually created were benchmarked according to international standards. So in a way you can argue that the nation, the federal level, really paid attention to global educational uh, policy, um, examples, models, um, agencies, et cetera, in order to create the standards in the first place. So who actually came up with the Common Core or what are the Common Core? The National Governors Association, the, the Council of Chief State School Officers, those were the two funding organizations. Um, they talk about how they, they did that work in, in consultation with teachers, parents, experts, administrators. That's true, but it was much further along into the process. Those were the organizations that really ended up developing the standards, and then they had many, many opportunities for public comment, public feedback, et cetera. Um, at the present time, 46 states have adopted the Common Core. So to suggest at this point that it is not a significant movement you're, you're running out of fingers of ones that are left. I mean, the 46 states already have adopted the Common Core. It's a significant movement, and it will definitely change education uh, across the board. Um, at this point, it's starting to be turned over to a degree to a state process in that states are going to be monitoring the implementation of the Common Core more at a local level. Um, there certainly are deadlines and timelines that we'll talk about um, whenever this happens to want to work. Um, but we, we will be um, looking at also timelines that certainly have application to the entire nation. Um, and so there's a readiness uh, expectation for the entire country. There is also a lot of buy-in at this point on the part of um, discipline-specific organizations. For example, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics or the National Council of Teachers of English, NCTE. Those organizations are, are very strong. They were involved um, much earlier when we had that, we did show a slide. It, it was the one about the standards. They were very involved in creating standards during a number of those standards movements. Um, they certainly have been uh, involved to an extent in the, core, in the Common Core Standards uh, creation, but it, it is now at a point of of them thinking about the implementation more than the actual like, yep, I think those are, those are great, they make sense, et cetera. Some other key goals related to the creation of the standards have to do with um, the, the depth and breadth. When you look at math standards, for example, even the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics will tell you that the, um, the, the way that they had worked out standards in the past was typical um, in that it was a, um, a mile wide and an inch deep. Just so, so, so many, many things that, that teachers were expected to pay attention to that honestly it became like, I, I can't do all those. So I'm gonna make up my own decisions. And again, that went into that level of teacher autonomy. Like if you feel like it's, it's a losing battle in the first place, you're not gonna feel that there's a sense of accountability or expectation tied to it. So you're gonna kind of make up you know, do the best that you think makes sense um, within your district, within your uh, course team, et cetera, et cetera. So the standard criteria for creating the Common Core was that they wanted to ensure that they were aligned with college and career readiness, 
They wanted to ensure that they would be user friendly. They wanted to be to ensure that they would be consistent across all the states, that they would include both content and application of higher order thinking skills, and that they would build upon the strengths of top performing um, nations. Again, that comparison globally um, was important to them. And then finally, the evidence-based research was another important component. There's a great deal of research that, that is sort of supporting and is behind the definition of the Common Core Standards. From a systems impact perspective, um, the immediate impact is for teachers who are involved in teaching mathematics and English language arts, as I've said. Those are the two disciplines where the core is already created. It's written, it's done, it's ready. Um, it's at the stage now where the, the expectation for districts is that they will be um, aligning their current curriculum with those common core standards and defining an implementation plan. As I said before, it is, however, promoted as a state-led effort. So phase one basically was adoption 2010-2011. Phase two, now, uh, coming up uh, next year, 2011-12, continues the design and implementation system, continues communication with community members, et cetera, and continues resource development. And then finally, phase three is a transition um, toward the implementation of new statewide assessments, which are expected to uh, be written and ready in 2014-2015. Some interesting things about that assessment information, ISAT and PSAE, the Prairie State tests, at the present time are, are, will continue in Illinois to be in place until 2014, 2015, when that new Common Core system will be in place. Um, the Common Core assessment is designed to be uh, pretty unique, something that educators uh, like myself has not really seen in the past. When you think about Prairie State, and we've done that for, for years and years, um, whether it's at the grade school level or the high school level, that has always been a single measure type test. It's the, the one or two days that the kids take the exam, and, and that's, that's the test, that's the score. One of the key thoughts about this assessment instrument for the Common Core, and a key change, is that it will not be a singular measure. Um, in education, we talk about formative assessment instruments and summative assessment instruments. A formative instrument is, um, is something that really allows you to understand where the gaps are and, and, and helps you as an educator try to understand what are students not getting. I taught it, but how many of them really learned it? And what did they really learn and what did they not really learn? There's a great deal of, of data now that educators look at through software systems like maybe a mastery manager system or something like that, where you get a whole kind of report card on your entire class about the key standards that you're teaching based upon the assessment instrument that you use. And so there's a um, kind of a deeper, a deeper understanding of what might have been a typical item analysis of a test, but it's not really just the item analysis. It really ends up being, um, it can be project-based, it, be, uh, it can be item based, test based, et cetera. But the thinking and the practice now is that teachers will pay attention all along the way of who gets it or who doesn't get it. And when there isn't a, a level of understanding, then they go back and, and do that reteaching and do that review and, and differentiate really their instruction for who happened to understand it and who didn't understand it, and they make modifications basically on the fly. This testing instrument is designed that you will get core, common core formative assessments. They're saying right now three and one summative assessment. So it's a, it's a richer way of looking at assessment data. And um, I think in a lot of ways as an educator, a more realistic way of how you continuously believe in students can get it. They will make progress. What I do in my classroom has an impact. Um, I'm going to work with you as opposed to, well, that test is over. I'm sorry you didn't do well. Now we're gonna teach this idea. And, and you certainly could understand from a student motivation standpoint why they're not engaged and ready to keep you know, fighting the good fight. Um, 
That has to do with just regular grading, et cetera. The assessment system design itself um, is such that um, they're looking at the standards being more meaningful. They're looking at a higher quality test because of the way that I described it. Um, they're also looking at maximizing technology. They plan to utilize technology so that schools would actually have these reports within a week after students take the test, which is obviously wonderful, much more consistent with how we get our own data. But typically, when you take a state test, just to use the current example, our students take the test in April, and schools get the results that they're supposed to check and make sure are accurate and correct, et cetera, in late July, early August. Well, you missed a whole lot of chance there to ensure that kids you know, really could benefit from that test information. They're already then into the next school year, different teachers, different classes, different everything. And so it, it's, it's sort of this um, uh, analysis as to why the, why the patient passed away almost, as opposed to um, you know, let's, let's see wh what, what is the type of protocol that we can um, implement in order to help, to help you get it. Some other key things to talk about in terms of the Common Core. There's still a lot of things that we don't know. Um, we don't know exactly what the new assessment will look like, although we have some insight into some of the pieces and, and some of the philosophy behind it. We don't know what type of technology will be needed, for example. Uh, we know that they want to make it technologically based, but we don't know what type of technology the school will need. Um, we don't know when other uh, disciplines um, common core will be written and will be completed. We know that social studies is on the list and we know that science is on the list, but we don't exactly know when those will be completed. In terms of the English language outs, we're getting more specific about the actual common core um, documents themselves. I thought it might be interesting to just see if you're a teacher, hey, look at that. But we, and we don't know, we don't know all that stuff. I just talked about that. It's a good thing I know most of this without that. Um, this is an example of the Common Core document for math. So this is a K-12 document. Um, if you were looking just at the high school pages, it would be from the green tab on. So here's what I have to worry about. I don't have to worry about all of it. But here's, here's what the high school people have to worry about, and here's, what, here's the rest of all the other grades. Um, the, the math programming is written in such a way that it's very conceptual, especially at the high school level. Um, they don't end up writing, um, you got some information here that you might want to take, take a look at. They have, for instance, algebra and geometry standards together. They have, for instance, um, the concept itself much more so than in this course you will learn um, sort of what the old math standards said, you know, this particular item, then the next item, then the next item, then the next item. It was literally kind of death by multiple items. Um, that packet that I just showed you, there certainly is a great deal of an expectation that schools will be articulating with one another and their programs will be um, carefully aligned with the Common Core so that as a kindergartner, literally moves into a first grade, literally moves to second grade, literally moves to third grade, each grade level is standards based. And so rather than allowing, again, a regular classroom teacher to determine what that curriculum is, by the end of that year, these are the mastery expectations of that kindergartner and those are all written out. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's somewhat of a shift in the philosophy of um, promotion uh, within a school system as well. When you look at the, the timeline for um, additional disciplines, you see that um, the Common Core is expected to be fully implemented by 2013-14. Uh, science standards are expected in the fall of 2012. So the other disciplines outside of English and math are coming, science, social studies, et cetera. Um, Science also, or social studies also will be a little bit more uh, holistic. It'll be a little bit more global um, and not as um, kind of picky in a way as individual um, units. Some of the exciting things about that and uh, the Common Core in general is 
that some people say teachers aren't going to be able to be creative. They're, not, they're losing their autonomy because someone else is deciding exactly what they should teach. To an extent, there's some level of, of truth to that because there is the expectation that you are meeting these standards, that by the end of grade whatever, your student is going to be able to achieve these standards. The beauty of that is that the student will know them, the parent will know them, the school system will know them, and that gap analysis will be much more universal. There's a lot of strength in the collaboration that can be a part of that type of a system. Um, and coming from a community that really believes in a very strong partnership between parents, between the home, the student, and the educator, we're all for that. We, we want our kids to understand what the standards or what we call them uh, targets are. We want kids to own the targets. We want them to know them. We want them to understand them. We want them to be able to reflect on their own progress related to them. So that type of communication and um, that level of ownership will be a positive thing. Districts continue to work on then that transition plan. How will they move forward to ensure that, um, that staff understands the Common Core, that they realize that their level of creativity and their level of investment now becomes how to help every individual student meet that gap um, and ensure that they're successful. They're not going to spend as much time deciding on the what of what they're teaching. They're going to spend tons of individual and collaborative time on the how. And they're going to think very carefully about individual students within their class and their own achievement record. Where, what areas are problematic and what areas do they have as a slam dunk? How do I continue to bolster some of those weaknesses? And how do I um, uh, complement and motivate the student for some of those strengths? The state is working on longitudinal data systems and expanding, again, those connections to post-secondary uh, situations, experiences such as college and or career. Um, and also they're expanding the data collection to early childhood, and I know that you'll hear more about the early childhood side in just a minute. Um, last thing, uh, the state is also working on a lot of other legislative changes that have implications for educators outside of the Common Core. Um, the Performance Evaluation Reform Act ties teacher performance, principal performance, to student growth. So this is another example of an educational reform issue that really changes the, the landscape of, of our profession. Um, the, again, the good news is that it's focused on student learning. Um, kind of old school educational philosophy was, I taught it. I don't know if they learned it, but I taught it. <laughs> You know, the whole focus obviously now is, are they, did they learn it? That's great that you taught it. You might have to teach it three and four and five different ways or three and four and five different times. We have to make sure that by the end of grade X, Y, Z, they really have learned it. And so some of these types of, of educational legislative reforms will continue to ensure that, that that message is sent very strongly that education in, in Illinois, education in, um, the, the, the country, the nation, is about student growth and performance. Um, and then last, just some other resources that you might want to take a look at. And um, I'll email anybody the PowerPoint since you only saw about half of it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hebson. You really uh, were on your feet today without the uh, PowerPoint. So thank you for doing such a fine job. There's a lot of what you've heard that I, w I will try and help you connect to the importance of early childhood in achieving all of the things that Ralph and Dr. Hebson spoke about um, today. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, and I, I'll start with, I'll actually start backwards. Um, your process of reaching consensus as the League of Women Voters on what position to take on the role of federal government in public education. When I received this in my newsletter, I was overwhelmed with the depth and the scope of the work that the League is taking on. And if anyone's up to it, it's the League because that's your reputation of doing all the due diligence and the research before taking a position. 
but I was very grateful to see that my part of the program was the last two questions mm -hmm. out of this very complex issue. And what happens in our conversations as we work um, at Voices across all issue areas that affect all age ranges of children, when you talk about education and the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act at the federal level, people relate to different aspects of that complexity in a way that it quickly becomes overwhelming and hard to know where to even start and all the elements of funding equity and the common core standards and the teacher effectiveness and the assessment process start to have people's eyes glaze over and so all of it is really, really important, but your work and your process is very complex. And congratulations to you, and thank you for taking it on. Best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, though you're not alone in doing this, obviously people are paying close attention to this. Our approach is to consider what outcomes we're looking for, and as has been stated, College and career readiness is the number one goal because we're all concerned about the impacts of the Great Recession, the state and federal budget crises. We know we have to get our economy back on track. That means having a qualified, prepared workforce, college and career ready to get the economy back where it needs to be stable and a return to prosperity. There's a P20 Council in Illinois that was legislated to address a comprehensive coordinated educational system that offered seamless transitions from birth to college and career. And so when we take a look at that system level approach and start working backwards, we know the goal and the stated goal of the P20 Council is that by 2025, 60% of the adult workforce in Illinois will be college and career prepared, either a degree or a certificate, so they're ready to enter the workforce. When you work backwards from that, we know that there, a student has to have the skills to go to college or study for a career credential that doesn't require remediation. That's a, an astounding complexity in our educational system that means Kids are going to college and spending their year, their tuition dollars, and our taxpayer subsidies to make up for what they don't know. You go backwards from that college and credential readiness to high school graduation rates and opportunities for students who didn't manage to graduate from high school to return to school somehow um, to, so that we offer some alternatives to dropouts so that they can achieve that goal of college and career readiness. You work backwards from graduation rates and the ACT test is currently the measure of college readiness. It's been pointed out that every Illinois high school junior takes the ACT test as part of their assessment process they get their score, but what happens for those students whose scores indicate they're not college and career ready? What are we doing with that senior year? You work backwards from the ACT test and you look at is an eighth grader ready to enter high school and take the algebra and be prepared, especially with the implementation of common core standards? When you look at the transition from elementary, middle school to high school, you have to go back to did that student have the reading skills that were needed for them to be able to learn. So third grade reading levels are a key indicator of all of this success because the research tells us up until third grade, a child is learning to read at fourth grade, they're expected to have the skills to be able to read to learn. So it's a benchmark, again, that we have to be looking at. And we know, going back, that the transition 
from preschool into kindergarten and those early ele elementary years is very key because we know access to high quality early education programs are an indicator of a child's entering school ready to learn. There's an initiative in the state that's working on kindergarten readiness assessment that will help the elementary school level educators know that their students are really ready to learn and will be able to achieve that third grade reading level that's so important. We know that early childhood education has been a hallmark of Illinois' work. And it's important that we look at, at how this all comes together in terms of what the science and the research and the data tell us. And that's a trademark of the work that we do at Voices. We try and transform. We work very hard to take the data, the science, the research, transform it into a message that can be understood articulated and repeated so that not only the policymakers get it but that the political will is generated by the general public to be able to convince policymakers why it's important that the investments are made in the areas that the research tells us produce the best outcomes for kids and are most cost effective for the state and produce the college and career ready students that will lead us back to economic stability and prosperity. So I'm going to kind of focus all of this together in talking about what the data tells us, a kind of quick snapshot reinforcing what we've heard of where we are in Illinois, and then what is currently going on at the federal level that impacts all of this. So um, I get to give you the good news about the research that says that investing in families that can support their children in ways that they feel safe, secure, have access to their, their daily living needs in terms of shelter, food, clothing, and care, that those investments are key to a child's being able to enter school ready to learn. And that, some of the most compelling research comes from Dr. James Heckman, who is a University of Chicago Nobel Laureate Award winning economist. And I stress economist because you would expect a child development expert or an education expert to be moving in this direction. But his research documents and demonstrates that supporting children from their very earliest years, and he's now talking about not just the children, we have to help their families be ready to support their children, that those investments actually produce a 10% return per year in increased personal achievement and social productivity a 10% return on investment if we invest in early childhood care and education opportunities. We also documented the return on investment here in Illinois in collaboration with the early learning partners um, from the Ounce of Prevention Fund and Illinois Action for Children. So Voices, Action, and the Ounce commissioned a study called the Wilder Report that documents that preschool not only prepares children for success in school, but produces up to $530 million in annual savings and revenue in Illinois, which is actually a return on investment greater than the investment that we're making. So we know that these investments pay off. What could we do with an extra $530 million <clears throat> in revenue or savings? Our own research at Voices is based on the Kids Count Data Book, which is a snapshot, a state of the state report on how children in Illinois are faring. And our 2011 book, and this is available on our website, is called Graded Eight. And we're looking at the, tr the opportunities in pre-birth to third grade to really look at the whole child 
and stress the need for investments in the whole child and getting them to be ready at the time that they enter school having the skills and the supports that they need and what's really important is that we know it's important to look at not just readiness to learn and school achievement but the social and emotional development as well because it's the whole child that we have to focus on not just the siloed effects of their age ranges and their experiences. So currently we are very challenged in putting that solid research and data to good use because of many of the things that Ralph talked about, the impact of poverty. So I will give you some of these numbers, and again, you don't have to remember this. Our website has these fact sheets with all of this information. But this tells a story that we have to pay attention to. The 2010 census data, which was recently released, tells us that there are 600,000 Illinois children who live in households with an annual income of $22,113 for a family of four. Currently, that rate is 19.4%, one in five kids. And that's an <coughs> increase from 16.6% in 2007, the pre-recession figure. 22% of kids age six are living in households who meet that poverty criteria. And that's important because those early learning years are when brain development peaks. And we have science that can demonstrate that through MRI brain scans that shows the difference in brain development for children who have family support, a nurturing environment, and the stimulation that they need in their, their physical, cognitive, and social and emotional development. All of this translates to the highest poverty rate for children since 1993. It's projected based on Brookings Institution an analysis of previous smaller recessions that even when the recession is declared over by the economist, which we're not so sure that they really declared it over, or it's been declared over and June what? June of 2009. Yeah. So find people who believe that, Ralph. The rate will continue, the rate continues to climb when the d recession is declared over. So the economists have looked at the factors and declared the recession over. People are not feeling the impact of the recession ending. And so the rate will continue to climb and in 2012 it's projected that one in every four Illinois children will be living in a household at that poverty level. And we have another recent report that was commissioned by the Chicago Foundation for Women that did an analysis of the impact of the recession on single mother households. And that data tells us that one fourth of all Illinois children live in a household with a single mom and that 40% of those households are living below that poverty level and that compares 40% for single mom-headed households, 22% for single dad, and 6% if it's a married couple. Um, we also know that there are major challenges in areas that didn't have to deal with these issues due to the impacts of the recession. So in Lake County, um, Feeding America tells us that there are 43, 100, 43,170 children who live with food insecurity. And that's a rate of 21.8%. Again, more than one in every five ch children in Illinois live in a household where they're not guaranteed where their next meal is coming from. All of this data is important because it tells us, and we know, that there are ramifications from that. So the recession, economic insecurity, leads to increased family stress, maternal depression, exposure to violence and trauma, and developmental delays. And that affects children's health, readiness for achievement, and future earnings. And we know, again, in terms of looking at school readiness and success, 
that currently in Illinois, in the public school students of Illinois who qualify as low income, which is twice the federal poverty level, so that's an income of about $44,000 a year for a family of four. 45% of all students in Illinois public schools live in households that are deemed low income. And in six of the uh, state's largest school districts, including Waukegan and including Chicago, that rate is 70%. 70% of their student body is challenged by issues as a result of poverty. We know that that contributes to a reading achievement gap and that, again, the racial and income disparities are really stark. 78% of white students, 40% of African American, and 48% of Latino students are reading at grade level by the end of third grade using the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress um, standard. And the key factor there, again, is that for non-low income students, they read at grade level at a rate of 80%. For low income students, that rate is 47%. Illinois is among the 10, among the 10 largest states, Illinois has the second widest achievement gap in third grade reading level. And another example of, of how that translates to future school success Chicago uses the Iowa test of basic skills, and when you um, look at third graders reading at grade level, um, those students who are not at grade level, 45%, only 45% graduate high school within five years of starting high school. So the data tells connecting tells us how important it is to connect those dots and continue to work backwards not that you write off any students but we know the best achieve the best outcomes and the most cost effective outcomes come invest in investing in family supports and early childhood care and education so in illinois our response to that has been to reduce funding for these programs um, sometimes I have the opportunity to leave the state and talk with my colleagues in other areas and sometimes you have to leave Illinois to feel good about Illinois. We actually were the model for other states in our early childhood care and education. As recently as 2008, we were ranked number one in access for three-year-olds to quality preschool programs, and we're always among the highest national rankings in access to preschool, but also in our quality standards for preschool. Um, the budget has had a, a serious impact. The spending has been reduced in these critical programs, and so from 2009 to 2011, 11,600 children lost the opportunity to access quality preschool. And the budget cuts in FY12 meant another 4,000 students lost that opportunity. And the um, early intervention, which is a really important um, service that's provided to children between birth and three, that helps a family get those services that might help a child overcome some developmental delays, or disabilities that would, if left unattended, will absolutely guarantee they'll go into special education. Early intervention often provides the supports at a critical time in the child's development to actually prevent some of that special education placement and cost. Um, those services have been reduced significantly so that thousands of infants and toddlers no longer have access to the services that they need. The Early Childhood Block Grant, which funds the, the preschool programs, was reduced by 5% in the last budget year. And in the Chicago public schools, federal funds from the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act were used to hold funding flat um, in the last school year. This school year, they've been able to keep the funding flat um, so no children lost services by using Title I funds, which are funds that are dedicated to children um, from low-income households. 
So knowing all of this and knowing how uh, challenged Illinois is in doing the right thing, which the laws are on the books, preschool for all is there. Early intervention services have been in place since 1985 because Illinois recognized the need to meet the needs of high-risk kids. Um, all of that being, given, uh, being the given for where we are in Illinois, we really do want to look at the role of the federal government and the opportunities that are being presented in Illinois and being used in Illinois to fill some of this gap. So some of the uh, recent, uh, recent report from the Brookings and Urban Institute tell us that uh, nationwide, the federal government accounts for one-fourth of total public spending on children ages six to 11, half of the spending on children ages three to five, and three-quarters of the spending on children birth to two comes from the federal government. And in that birth to two category, that federal funding comes in the form of Medicaid, the Earned Income Tax Credit, the Child Tax Credit, the WIC, and the SNAP programs. Now, if you follow the federal debate in the health care, WIC and SNAP are often federal programs that are assuring access to food and um, to the meeting the basic living needs of infants, toddlers, and small children through those programs, and they're often uh, raised as entitlement programs where sp spending should be reduced. Again, research tells us absolutely the wrong thing to do. So in Illinois, we've had the benefit of um, $300,000 to early learning, uh, to the Early Learning Council, which is the stakeholder group of experts that convenes in a public-private partnership to address early learning, early childhood care and education opportunities. So through the ARA funds, um, the Early Learning Council has been able to receive money to implement innovative models to engage hard to reach families. So there are federally supported programs in Early Head Start and Head Start that help children um, in addition to the state preschool for all program. And we're finding that eligible children are not enrolled in the programs. There's a disconnect between the existing slots and the kids most at risk who need those slots. So efforts are underway to develop some innovative ideas, some using best practices, looking at what other states are doing to ensure that those hard to reach families and kids have access to programs that are in place for them. Um, now, this most recently, these last couple of months, there's been an award to Illinois of a competitive maternal infant and early childhood home visiting program funds. Um, we will get $12.1 million over a four-year period to enhance case management to first-time um, teen mothers who participate in home visiting. There's an innovative opportunity to bring in doula services to support, especially those teen moms, single moms, to know, to, so that the teen moms know the right things to do to support their infants. And there's a, a fussy baby program that is proven through work at the Erickson Institute to really address the difficulties of dealing with special needs babies. And sometimes not just special needs babies, but stressed parents who need that extra support. Home visiting is one of the earliest steps we can take to support families with um, infants, toddlers, and small children. So this is a very exciting opportunity to take federal dollars, invest in Illinois proven programs, and meet the moms who have the highest risk. We also have several stakeholder groups that are working in an interagency collaboration through the Office of Early Childhood Development, which is out of the governor's office, the Department of Human Services, the State Board of Education, and the Home Visiting Task Force of the Early Learning Council. They're collaborating on formula grants that will use federal dollars that equal um, set over $7 million, that they've identified these high-risk communities 
where home visiting services will be implemented and data will actually be collected. Illinois struggles with being able to prove outcomes because there's inadequate data. Um, we're also looking at an application that's been submitted and this is breaking news. This application uh, was sent to the federal government just October 19th and there is money through the Early Learning Challenge Fund. You may recall Mary Manuel announced a major early learning initiative that is, looks at quality ratings of the early childhood programs and offers a web portal. He's proposing to offer a web portal that parents could use to explore programs in their neighborhood and know the quality ratings for those programs. That was part of the Early Learning Challenge Fund application that will fulfill the purpose of the federal grant, which is to improve quality of early learning and uh, close the achievement gap for children with high needs. So there's a complex application that's available online if you have an interest in getting more. And as the league does its work, there are several resources that um, we would suggest could be very helpful. One is through our national partner, Voices for America's Children, which is tracking on a daily basis, sending alerts, helping people understand what's going on with the reauthorization of the um, Education and Secondary Education Act. We have been targeted in Illinois because of our leadership, Representative Bigger and Senator Kirk in particular. We've held town hall meetings. We're supporting Representative Biggert in her bipartisan legislation for social and emotional learning. And all of these updates will track the actions in Washington that are important to the work that we're doing here in Illinois that will talk about why the federal support is so important in using the states as their, the opportunity to set the standards measure the outcomes and lead to good positive outcomes for the kids so that we get back on track through that whole sequence of events for college and career readiness. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I have this one. Um, we have time. It's about a quarter to nine. I think we're going till nine, are we? Uh, for a few questions. Are there some? I think, is this one on? Because. Working now. I think it's your your thing is working now. I'm working, but if someone's got a question, maybe. They can have one of ours. Tell me, ooh, tell me, and uh, I'll restate it for you. Hello. Uh, Ralph, I'd like to ask you. You had a great deal to say about what we're doing wrong on tax policy. I'm sure that's correct. What should we be doing? What is the blueprint for the correct tax policy? foster good education in America? Well, uh, anyone that wants a detailed blueprint uh, for what the state of Illinois ought to be doing, go to the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability's website, go to the Funding Our Future report, and everything you've ever wanted to know about tax policy and how it works is right there in, I think, eloquent prose. <laughs> that said, Illinois needs a progressive income tax is so we need a constitutional amendment to implement that. We've modeled it out. If we went to a progressive rate structure with the top rate at 11% for millionaires, uh, that's what other, other top rates are across the country. The effective tax rate on millionaires would only be 4.7% after deductions. 94% of the state would get a tax cut and we'd raise 3.6 billion more and the high effective rate would actually be 4.7%. That's number one. Number two, we need to expand the sales tax base to include services, consumer services. Uh, Newsflash, 60% of the private sector economy is services. Our sales tax doesn't hit them. It covers the sale of goods. That's only 12% of the economy. You, you can't leave the largest and fastest growing segment of your economy entirely out of your tax base and balance your budget. So that's number two. Uh, number three, we would want to target some tax relief to low and middle income families in addition to the rate structure uh, because that will stimulate the economy. Uh, low and middle income families have for a long time had flat or declining incomes. Since the recession did officially end in June of 2009, wages are lower now 
than at the lowest point of the Great Recession. We have fewer jobs now than at the worst point of the Great Recession. Corporate profits are up $460 billion. So at the federal level, what we probably need to do is raise taxes on affluent people, undo the Bush tax cuts. Everyone talks about you know, getting the federal deficit in control. And by the way, if they do that, we're going into a depression. So if they stop federal deficit spending now, America goes into a depression, not a recession. No question. Because we're not creating jobs in the private sector. 42% uh, of the federal deficit today is the Bush tax cuts and the interest on the debt to finance the Bush tax cuts. So why that's not on the table is beyond me. And, and since low and middle income families have been having flat or declining income since 1980, uh, giving them some tax relief targeted will free up their income to spend, and they will, and they'll spend it in their local economies. So that's the tax package for the state, expand the sales tax base, go to progressive rate structure, uh, tax some retirement income for those seniors in the room, you shouldn't get a free ride anymore, uh, tax some retirement income and then provide targeted tax relief to low and middle income families at the federal level, tax rich people a lot more. www.ctbaonline.org. That's good. Another question? Yes, the closer lady here. Dr. Hickson, with the uh, changes that you're going to make in standards and assessments, will the children be spending a lot more time in testing? Ask if the children will be spending a lot more time in testing. Well, yes, from the standpoint of um, these types of tests will be more often than the current state test, but no from the standpoint of um, right now in order to prepare them for the state test, we're doing a fair amount of test monitoring on our own because we need that progressive data along the way. So in, in effect, in my opinion, it'll be a wash. Someone else kind of doing the testing, um, but getting us the data in such a timely manner, which will be so different than what we're used to, that we can actually use it and then peel back some of the instruments that we're using on our own. Right. Somebody back here? Yes. You know, I have a question about the assessments and the Common Core standards. My question is, uh, I, what will the government um, do with the assessments? How are they, what, 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 what like today, they're doing, you know, they're giving money or not giving. What will they? What will they do with these assessments? And two, will they get involved in in the how? You're asking about the accountability side of the yes. Common Core, and it is not defined. That was one of the slides that you didn't see that had four question marks <laughs> in the corners. That part of of it is not defined. Um, I could, I could tell you at the Federal Commission, we're looking at that issue now, and uh, one of the recommendations I strongly endorse there is that we go away from a punitive method of dealing with a, the assessment strategy. You shouldn't take resources away uh, from communities in poverty. Uh, that guarantees more failure. It doesn't help you resolve problems. And so hopefully uh, one of the main recommendations that will come out of our commission will deal specifically with that issue and deal with it in a little more enlightened way. And we have a number of alternatives that are far more positive. Uh, but some of them are pretty tough. And uh, for instance, the federal government coming in and taking over a school district that's not performing after years of trying to and things like that. I mean, we're going to have to get to a situation where if you're not going to take resources away, there does need to be a hammer over the head. 
And I, I frankly am all for that. Uh, if, if a state's not going to, in addition to devoting the financial resources, ensure that the teaching staff is at a high quality, ensure that the academic program is rigorous, ensure that the students have technology, then take away their ability to control their own school district and fix it. And the other thing that's expected to be a part of the accountability system, though, is more of a, a look at a growth model rather than oh, yeah. somewhat of an arbitrary benchmark. And, and so that is, a, that is hopefully a, a very significant change in just the definition of success versus a failing school. And in the immediate, um, cons in, under immediate consideration is legislation that's already passed the House and will be taken up in the Senate next week as the second um, part of the veto session that um, changes, revises the state's report card. So all the recent articles of how, this, how the various school districts fared, um, there's a proposal that would actually reformat the state report card and it looks like a pyramid. So there would be a one page report card two sides that includes a variety of metrics that align with legislation, common core standards, has placeholders for things that are under development. And the, the first level, the top of the pyramid would be the fact sheet that's available to parents and communities so that they would have an easy to understand assessment of where their school's doing well and where improvements might be needed. That will be followed by a subset of data that all of this is available, but it will be pre presented in three formats. The fact sheet, a subset intended to be used by individual school districts, school boards, school administrators to determine the data around their school, and then a third level, which will be all the data that will be conducive to research. Thank you. Um, this lady here. Uh, in, in all of the talk you know, through the years of No Child Left Behind and everything, we have focused on assessment, achievement, et cetera. There's not as much talk about the learner as I would like. It's more about the teachers and the outcome. And what I don't understand as a teacher, when I was a teacher, if I'd been in that kind of atmosphere, the things that make children learn, that is to stimulate their curiosity and their creativity and their critical thinking, these things, if, if a teacher can, can help that emerge in a child, the child, you can't hold them back and they're going to learn everything. But the creativity, the curiosity, the fuel of learning. The, the lady's asking about the atmosphere and some effective qualities uh, that teachers feel might be lost with the emphasis on standardized tests. Yeah, I mean, there, I, there's no doubt about that. I think, I think educators um, get very concerned about a, a singular measure or um, even just utilizing great achievement data as the measure of a school's success. You know, Deerfield and Highland Park High School, we're very fortunate that, that our achievement data is actually ex exceptionally strong. And yet, uh, in conversations that we have with our community, we continue to try to expand their definition of what a successful school does and what does that really mean and try to provide a holistic look mm -hmm. at that educational experience, much like what you're talking about in terms of ensuring that a student's personal passions are are there for the child there are opportunities that they can learn about themselves leadership opportunities etc that that not to suggest that the academics are not significant they certainly are but to ensure that you're really looking at an educational experience in a much broader more holistic way and our test orientation within the nation makes it difficult to expand that conversation 
the, the P20 Council work, which is an emerging group of stakeholders, again, legislated to look at the entire educational experience of a child, is very cognizant, and the school report card is a product of this work. It's, they're very cognizant that you can't look at educational achievement in the silos of um, teacher performance evaluations and data and assessment and test scores. It really has to be comprehensive and one element has to inform the other. And legislation has recently been passed that sets up elements of that and that's what the school report card will reflect. So there's the performance and evaluation, I forget the, the name of the act, review yeah. act. Mm -hmm. That was very significant reform that tied teacher performance to student outcomes in an attempt to say it's important to have effective teachers in the classroom. Well, again, working backwards, work has to be done in teacher preparation programs to ensure that teachers are trained. Principal preparedness now includes attention to early childhood education. So I would encourage the league in the work that you're doing to, to be focused on that as what is the need of the child versus, you know, how do we look at education formulas? How do we look at test scores? How do we look at teacher effectiveness? But it really needs to be put in the parameters of what's in the best interest of the child and then work down from there. And that doesn't happen unless you ask the question. Because in the work of the P20 Council, the Data Assessment Committee set up a school report card subcommittee, and it immediately went to, well, the teachers weren't so crazy about this metric about teacher evaluation or teacher attendance. And school climate, how do we define that? And kindergarten readiness, that's not just if a child's been to preschool, what about the kids who haven't been to preschool? So again, it, it takes being always cognizant of asking the question, what are we trying to achieve and how does it benefit the individual students? Okay, it's 9 o'clock. We did start a few minutes late, so I'm proposing uh, three more questions. I saw this lady here before, and then I saw you. Yes. With what appears to be a clear discriminatory impact on minority students in the state of Illinois, are any of the panelists aware of whether the ACLU or some other organization has considered legal action? The, you know, the question, I'll repeat the question, has to do with are there any uh, legal actions, any lawsuits in place uh, regarding this disparity in our state uh, of fairness? Yeah, the Chicago Urban League has a suit that survived summary judgment. It was, it, all the constitutional claims were thrown out. But there is a Civil Rights Act in Illinois that has been upheld. Now, they haven't been overly aggressive in pursuing it, and I am not going to publicly say why, but there is a flaw in the case as they filed it. Uh, other, other cases are being considered, and CTBA has actually been a, an advisor on these cases, but there's not a lot of hope for that to bring about systemic change. We have very bad Supreme Court law and constitutional law in Illinois when it comes to guaranteeing a child's right to an education. In fact, our Constitution does not. Uh, all the language in the Illinois Constitution that says the state has the primary responsibility to provide uh, children a, a public education, fund a public education, has all been determined to be horatory, merely advisory. And so it doesn't create any absolute right. You're not going to resolve this with litigation. I, I, I think you get episodic results. I think you need legislative change at the state level and I think more importantly the federal government to step in and go right now it funds about 10 percent of the cost of public education nationally I think the feds should be somewhere between 30 and 40 percent I think that money should be driven into communities of poverty and then up to middle income communities and I think in addition to the resources the federal government needs to 
create new sort of West points on teacher education and the nation needs to bump up teaching salaries dramatically so that uh, we actually have a competitive wage to draw on the best and the brightest. I, what, what hasn't been said, all this accountability stuff and holding teachers' feet to the fire for, for children's performance, et cetera, has come about because there's been a change in the teaching workforce over the years. Uh, back in the good old days when women didn't have careers available to them, they became teachers or nurses. And the labor market recognized that and paid teaching and nursing very low wages because it didn't have to pay a lot to get the best and the brightest. When other career alternatives opened up to women in America that paid a lot more and were more prestigious, guess what? The best and the brightest went and did that. So now we have a significant pipeline problem in having really the same quality level of teachers that we had decades ago. We just don't. And there's a rational reason for it. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna solve that by trying to find new ways to say the current teachers aren't as good as they used to be. They're not as good as they used to be because we don't pay them enough to attract in that talent. And every nation we benchmark ourselves against, the Finlands, whatever, pay teachers at the top, okay? So the, the prime minister of Finland, when he was interviewed about what, what do you do about getting rid of bad teachers, so we don't have bad teachers in Finland. If you're, if you're bad, you don't get in. So we need some big changes that don't happen either through litigation or really at the state level. This has to come from the feds. Thank you. Yes. I, I would just say one quick thing about that. And then I was a teacher formerly. And I say to my students all the time, No, I, and I, but it's a pipeline issue. I mean, there's been a change. I mean, you, you still get some very bright, dedicated people. It ain't like what it used to be. That wasn't a question. So no. my question was, um, going to um, Kathy's comments about the food insecurity, which really is all uh, when I heard that statistic several months ago, I really haven't gotten it out of my mind. And no matter what takes place, um, if they're leaving home hungry, um, if they're not getting some kind of federally supported breakfast or lunch or after school snack, all the best legislation in the world is, is not going to be as impactful as it could be. You cannot keep a child who is hungry. Um, so the question becomes, how does that, how does that issue, how is that issue being addressed? How is the talk about a holistic approach. Yeah. Yeah. How is the hunger issue <coughs> being addressed? Um, the governor recently named a commission oh, to end hunger, and I share the um, children and um, well. families at risk subcommittee, and there are other subcommittees looking at different populations, vulnerable adults and then uh, adults with special needs. And the common themes as the work groups come together is that there's a lack of take up of the federal opportunities that exist. So Illinois was recently ranked as one of the lowest take up states, meaning we have the fewest school breakfast programs among other states in the country, even though that's a federally paid for program. And um, Mary Manuel actually required that in CPS and Chicago Public Schools, there is universal breakfast. Mm -hmm. So they've gone to not even uh, an eligibility cr criteria as free and reduced lunch, but saying every student in Chicago Public Schools qualifies for free breakfast. And then you'll recall the news where families said, well, that takes away from instructional time and our children have allergies. So there's problem solving that has to be done with that, but the recommendations of the commission are going to be, number one, let's take advantage of the federal dollars that are available to the state to get more children in fed. these fed. Mm -hmm. Breakfast, lunch, after school, summer feeding programs, child care programs, they exist and there are a lot of barriers that just need to come down because um, we know what works 
and you know it, that has to be addressed. The issue of the putting it into the whole system is really interesting because as we learn about these programs, we're connecting with the State Board of Education who has to actually deal with the implementation of school feeding programs. They provide school districts the data. Some of the pushback is coming from local school districts. And in some school districts, it's coming from the maintenance crews who say, you know, we, we don't want to deal with another um, food situation and, you know, cleaning up the cafeteria once again. But there are innovative programs that are showing us some models to do this. So there was a recent field trip to Roosevelt uh, High School in Chicago Public Schools that is one of the few high schools that's having success with a breakfast program and the students can either um, sit and eat their breakfast or pick it up and eat in the halls, which was a big contributor to the kids actually doing it, that you know they had a choice and they could eat where they wanted to eat, and the school has a climate of pride that actually started with the maintenance crews who were like, we take pride in the way this school looks, don't mess it up, and the kids have responded to that. So there's successful models and it does have to be built in because the, the data, the research again demonstrates that outcomes for teachers, even behaviorally, are improved when kids aren't hungry. Thank you. Last question, this lady here. Well, I want to go back to something that was mentioned. Um, I think the important thing is the growth of the individual child that you see over a year's time. A good teacher has those standards in her head and she's working with them and I don't want to give up a lot of time for a whole lot of tests because it takes time to teach writing and it takes time to teach reading um, and I don't want a child to feel a failure because he doesn't get a particular score. Uh, a question again regarding the, what really is the purpose of education and what can the teachers do instead of being hamstringed by data. I say here, here. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> okay, in agreement. Uh, a fitting and emotional conclusion to our program. I personally feel privileged to have been here to hear these speakers. I think they're outstanding. <laughs> <laughs>